You're listening to KZSC's Voces Críticas, Critical Voices. I am your producer and host, Silvana Falcone. Today I am here with Dr. Emily Houses. She was a 1995 graduate of Porter College, where she received her BA in music. She received her MSN and PhD from Yale University, the School of Nursing. She is currently an associate professor and regents professor at the University of New Mexico College of Nursing. She was inducted into the American Academy of Nursing in 2015. Dr. Houses conducts behavioral health research across the cancer continuum with a goal of improving symptom management and cancer outcomes with American Indians and Alaska Natives. Dr. Houses works from a social justice lens to address issues of health equity in underserved communities. Dr. Houses is a member of the Chiricahua Fort Sill Apache Tribe and is from Santa Fe, New Mexico. I've invited her to talk with me about her research as she will be on our campus on February 10th as the keynote speaker for the American Indian Health Symposium called Hearts, Minds, and Future. The event starts at 9.30 a.m. and will be held at colleges 9 and 10 in the multi-purpose room. Welcome, Emily, to KZSC's Voces Criticas. Thank you for having me. Now, you are from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and you attended Yale University all the way over there in Connecticut for graduate studies. Can you tell me what words of advice you would offer perhaps another Native woman attending Yale University today or perhaps another woman of color about your experience and what to expect? I would say, first of all, be prepared to build your own community because it may not be there, unlike at other places like Santa Cruz or in New Mexico, but you can kind of walk in and there is a community there. I found that that there wasn't a strong Native community and and there wasn't a cohesive community of women of color in uh, the College of Nursing where I was. So I had to reach out and find people, which is not something I was really used to or comfortable doing. I actually connected with another Apache woman who lived all the way in New York City. She probably doesn't even know it, but just knowing that she was there was really important to me and it kind of got me through. And the other thing was I saved my money so I could go home and just being able to go home for holidays and bring food back with me and having that connection made a really big difference. So how were you able to study and receive the training you wanted for American Indian Health at Yale University? When I interviewed there that I kind of knew it was a good fit for me is even at that interview, the person who eventually became my thesis and dissertation chair, my thesis advisor and then my dissertation chair, she said during the interview, oh, I have this friend in Montana who I've been trying to sort of connect with and she's always wanted to do research with me with the tribes in Montana. So maybe we could work together with you. And Already, she was thinking about how we could start building these relationships, and and I knew that that was going to be a good connection. So even though the faculty there maybe didn't know me or didn't know my communities, I could tell that they were open to learning, and even if I had to take the lead, they were happy to follow me. There are plenty of things about being on the East Coast that were foreign to me, but I did feel like the faculty did support me. Now, the Chiricahua, Fort Sill Apache tribe, is connected to the lands of Oklahoma and other parts of the Southwest, and now has a recognized reservation in New Mexico as of 2011. Can you provide some context of how this community came to establish this reservation in New Mexico? To know about how we came to New Mexico, it's important to know that we're from New Mexico. We're Geronimo's people among other important leaders. Geronimo was one of our members, and we were in the Southwest forever. We were relocated from New Mexico to Oklahoma by way of Florida in 1886, and we were held prisoners of war in Oklahoma until 1914 when we were released but kept in Oklahoma, essentially. We didn't have any money to leave. We didn't have a place to go. And 2011, our tribe was able to establish that we had this connection to New Mexico. And we purchased land in southern New Mexico that was in our territory, our ancestral territory, and we had that reservation federally recognized. We have been a federally recognized tribe since 1976, so we, we already have that status, but getting that reservation federally recognized was a whole other thing. You know, it was a great, a great victory for us to have that reservation. And, and, you know, having reservation land is complicated and has all of its other political sort of implications, and uh, it's a whole other conversation. But to have land that was ours, that's a big deal for us, to be able to be recognized as being from New Mexico again was a real homecoming. The New Mexico state governor refused to recognize this reservation. And so we actually had to 
we had to take her to court. It was um, Susanna Martinez. She's still the state governor, actually. Our lawsuit went before the state Supreme Court, and we won that unanimously in 2013. So now our reservation is recognized by the state and by the federal government. She is an interesting governor there in New Mexico. So how would you describe the relationships of Fort Sil Apache tribe with other native tribes there in New Mexico and even in the larger Southwest? Because I understand that these you know, state borders are in positions. They're not necessarily a reflection of the territory that belong to native peoples in this in this part of the country. So I think that our relationship here is complicated. When we were released from a prisoner of war status about uh, just before that happened, about half of our tribe, a little more than half of our tribe, did come back to New Mexico and decide to join the Mescalero Apache tribe. So we were split already. So there are folks down there who are culturally Chiricahua, but they're part of this Mescalero tribe. There's this complication, you know, politics in Indian country get pretty sticky. And there are people in the state who I think really support us because we went up to battle and we fought for our sovereignty and we demonstrated our sovereignty and we won. But then there's also just economic challenges that people everywhere here face. We're all in some ways fighting for some of the same slices of pie, and people feel challenged by that when there's yet another tribe in the state. I think that we have tried to demonstrate that we're all in it together, and we haven't taken anything away. We're trying to be value-added. Sometimes it can take so many generations, right, to mend those relationships that have been affected by trauma, whether it's from internally from the communities or as a result of genocide, colonial legacies, etc. Mm-hmm. You're listening to Dr. Emily Houses, Associate Professor and Regents Professor at the University of New Mexico College of Nursing. Dr. Houses conducts behavioral health research across the cancer continuum with a goal of improving symptom management and cancer outcomes with American Indians and Alaska Natives. So as a health specialist and research professor studying cancer, what are some of the most prevalent cancers affecting Native peoples today? That's a really interesting question, actually, because unlike other populations around the country, the cancer incidence changes by region. So, for example, in the southwest where I live, we have very low rates of lung cancer, high rates of colorectal cancer and kidney cancer. But when you go to the northern plains or on the Pacific coast, you have very high rates of lung cancer. So it really changes depending on where you are. One of the things that we do see is no matter where you go, there tends to be higher mortality than um, non-Hispanic whites because people tend to be diagnosed at much later stages than other communities. Some things that jump out, we see high rates of hepatic or liver cancer, um, higher rates than in the non-Hispanic white community. The other thing that jumps out at me is the high rate of cervical cancer, not so much the death rate, but the incidence rate, the, how many people are diagnosed every year. And the reason this jumps out at me is because like with breast cancer and with colorectal cancer, these are cancers that can be detected, they can be screened for, and with cervical cancer, we can prevent that largely, just like with colorectal cancer. Yet we're still seeing that in the Native American community, and we're seeing it in higher numbers than in other communities. And so that's one of the things that really drives my work is knowing that we have disparities that we can address, that these are changes that can happen, and they can happen in my lifetime. So one of your passions is linking Indigenous methodologies to methods of intervention for cancer. Can you explain a little bit about what you mean by an Indigenous methodology that you're seeking to incorporate in intervention research? Well, one of the first things is striving to do work with communities instead of doing research on communities. And that little change in language is also a change in the the whole philosophy because I work with the community. I follow what the community wants to do. I don't say, oh, I'm really interested in doing whatever, doing X, and then just designing a study and getting it funded and then going into the community and saying, guess what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to drop a bunch of money. I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to leave. We actually, we call that helicopter research because it's exactly what happens People come in and they fly over, they do their thing, and then they fly away. And that's definitely not what I do, and I try not to support that. So there's collaboration on this community-based participatory research, taking guidance from the communities. I like to, I want to, I always want to follow their priorities, check in and make sure that I'm still doing that. So that means always working with a community advisory board and valuing Indigenous knowledge and working from a non-hierarchical perspective, appreciating that, sure, I have this degree from Yale, but that's fairly meaningless when we're talking about what their priorities are. And even doing something like asking right up front, what is your definition of health? Because in Western medicine, the definition of health is very different from an indigenous perspective of health. You know, in Western medicine, their definition of health might be low blood sugars and a BMI of such and such. 
where in the community, the definition of health might be practicing your traditions and speaking your language. So what words of advice would you offer someone, perhaps another Native person or another person of color, if they're feeling frustrated with the medical interventions that they are receiving because they are invested in this Western logic that you're referring to, if their treatment that's being proposed to them does not align with what they think their well-being is or what that looks like, what would you counsel people in that situation? So I was raised and the Indian health service system and with that whole, the indigenous belief systems and, and this idea of respect, respecting our elders, respecting the people who are delivering our care. And so I had to learn this for myself and, and I learned it more from doing my research, knowing that the Western healthcare system is a profit-based system and uh, indigenous cultural norms about respect and honor just don't work within that system. And they don't even, they don't even think about that. And so when we have our native patients going for care, they're not reporting their symptoms. They're not talking about how they're uncomfortable because often they're feeling like this means that they're being disrespectful because the provider is going to feel like they're not appreciating the care they're receiving. And so what I often say to people is it's okay to get a second opinion. In fact, your providers, they expect it. They welcome it. They like to have many brains working on a problem. I tell people to ask for what they want. I know for me, I was used to waiting forever in a clinic room because that was the norm. You just wait and wait and wait, and eventually some will come. somebody will come and they'll, they'll take care of you. And if you went out and asked, that usually meant you were going to wait longer. But that's not true in the Western system. If you wait and wait and wait, they probably forgot about you. So I had to learn that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And one of the things, you find an advocate. And sometimes you have to be your own advocate. And that can be really hard because you have to step out of your skin a little bit. So I co-facilitate a cancer support group that is mostly non-Indian people. They're mostly non-Native Americans. They're um, mostly well-to-do people in Santa Fe. And one of my co-facilitators is a woman named Fred. And when I'm in a situation or when I'm talking to people, I think, what would Fred do? Because Fred is really good at getting on the phone and saying, no, I'm not satisfied with that. I need to get this. That That's just not going to work. And she will just keep asking the question or keep pushing until she gets what she wants because she's a privileged white woman. And so I tell folks, you know, advocate for yourself. And sometimes you just have to pretend you're a privileged white woman. And then they go, oh, yeah, okay, I can do that. Channel that inner Fred, I guess, right? Yeah, exactly. What would Fred do? You know, in our communities, you can actually, you'd be punished sometimes or shunned, or there are ways that our communities police each other for behaving outside the norm that doesn't happen in the dominant culture. Now, you also engage in research about cancer pain management. So what does that mean? And what are the needs of the Native communities that you're working with and partnering with? What does cancer pain management mean to them? I got started in this work doing research through talking to people about cancer pain management and symptom management because people were really suffering. There was real disparity in who was being treated for pain and who wasn't being treated for pain. And Native patients, the people that I was talking to, they just weren't getting their pain managed or addressed with the same sort of level of respect and appropriateness than other communities were. And I spend now time, I, I talk to people, I talk to clinicians about how to talk to their patients about pain because often patients aren't reporting their pain again because they don't want to make their clinician angry. And then the other thing that I found is that in the communities, the patients don't have access to well-trained or knowledgeable clinicians. This is starting to be addressed as we have telemedicine networks that are getting developed throughout the country. The clinicians can access the experts that they need when they have questions about difficult cases like patients with cancer. The other thing that we have a real barrier with managing pain is access to pharmacies that carry a full formulary. So that's not just having good, great opioids or that you know can treat anything, but of all the other good tools that are available to treat nerve pain, for example. If you have a small community pharmacy, they just don't have all of the tools that we need. And then the other thing is integrative therapy. There was a study that I did with some colleagues at University of Washington where they were trying to train clinicians in rural communities to work with patients, with Native patients um, using integrative therapies. And, we're, and I was like, wait a minute, do, do patients even want to use integrative therapies? And so we actually went out and asked them, and it turned out that, yes, they really wanted integrative therapies. They actually preferred that. And we asked them about things like acupuncture and massage, and they said, oh, yes, please. 
if I could have a choice, I would prefer having things like acupuncture, massage, chiropractor, physical therapy, all of those things. They want those. They don't want the medication that's going to make them foggy or constipated or affect their ability to do their job or be with their family. They wanted the things that will help them function in the day-to-day life and actually feel better. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for being with us today. I wondered if you had any final comments that you would like to share. Oh, you know, I wanted to say that this is a real honor and pleasure to be able to come to Santa Cruz and talk with you and talk on KGSC. It's exciting for me to be able to come back after all this time. Well, we're really looking forward to your visit. Again, Dr. Emily Houses is the keynote speaker for the American Indian Health Symposium called Hearts, Minds, and Future on February 10th. The event starts at 9.30 a.m. and will be held at Colleges 9 and 10 Multipurpose Room. Thanks again, Dr. Emily Houses, for being with us today. Thank you.